My name is Louis Lavoie. I am the creator of this project called The King of Kings. As I was painting these pictures, I became very curious about these kings and wanted to know more. So I would like to share some of my thoughts on these kings, why they're in here and who are they. So we need to start in the beginning, the origins of the kings. Who was the first king on the earth? And where do the royal families get their authority? It turns out most experts don't even know, and there are a few theories floating out there. Let's look at two of them. Theory one, follow me in this little story. I want you to imagine a tribal family. The leader is the patriarch, he's the grandfather, and his main job would be to settle dispute over conflict. Like, let's say, how do we split up this pizza between everybody? He'd come up with the best solution, and generally everybody was happy. Until one day, one of his grandsons, let's say, has a new idea that they should change the shape of the pizza. When you consider the best toppings are in the middle and everyone gets a crust. This way, everyone gets an equal portion. Unfortunately, the chief doesn't like this round pizza idea at all. He considers it going against tradition. But our young entrepreneur grandson who sticks by his convictions and every year brings up the round pizza idea. This causes conflict and eventually the chief asks him and a small group of supporters to leave the tribe. So they leave willingly and start up their own tribe. Things are good in the beginning except the best mushrooms, tomatoes and onions grow in the land of the former tribe. So they have to develop a bartering system. And one thing they come up with or invent is a much better cheese. So they sell their cheese for these fresh ingredients and everything's great. And this goes on for a while. Now jump 100 years into the story. Now we see the two larger tribes, they fragmented into smaller tribes. So there's much more tribes all over the land. And each tribe is trying to find its own identity. Some of them calling themselves the ham and pineapples, some calling themselves the salamis. So they all have their own little flags and emblems and they make t-shirts with, with their logos on it. This new generation no longer has the connection with the family kinfolk. They just see them as surrounding tribal neighbors, resulting in some of the tribes raiding other tribes. It eventually breaks into skirmishes and conflicts. Now, one of the tribes develops an army in order to protect themselves until they actually use that army to raid one of the smaller and, and less protected tribes. And in doing so, they actually wipe out the whole tribe and they learn something brand new. And that is, they learn the spoils of war, which allows them to confiscate all the possessions of that tribe, the land, their produce, their livestock. This is the first point I'd like to make, that the spoils of war equals tribes growing larger and stronger. Another thing they learn is that if they enslave the people in that land they've captured, get some free labor out of this, so they don't even have to work. Also, what's new for the tribe is they find they have a bunch of enemies, and the enemies cut them off of trade. This only justifies their excuse for ransacking and pillaging their neighboring tribes. Also, the chief is becoming very rich from skimming the top spoils for himself. It's at this point that he starts to share his vision of a large army that can seize all the land for themselves. He has now taken the first step of becoming a dictator, which is a type of king, and he creates a kingdom for himself, which will include an inheritance for his children. As the new kingdom starts to develop a greater army, the surrounding tribes only have one hope, and it's in the form of this chief. This chief with vision and purpose, as well as great diplomatic skills, is able to unite all the tribes together to stand against this menacing kingdom. Now this chief too is becoming a king. Now one of the big differences between somebody who is a ruler as a chief and somebody who is a ruler as a king is a king has a kingdom. Which brings me to my second point, and that is king equals kingdom, or kingdom is the vision of a sovereign ruler, which is a king. Now our second candidate to be king will only obtain the throne if he could defend his lands, have victory in battle, which in turn will win the hearts of his people. This little story is just a little quick synopsis of how kings come about. I know it's much more complicated than fighting over pizza. 
there are some great examples in history like the Mongolians in the 12th century where they conquered all the steppe people and became one of the most powerful and richest empires of that time. But surprisingly, this origin of kings is a more modern theory and is widely accepted by most Darwinian anthropologists. The second theory, this theory comes from the ancient kingdoms themselves. Now all these kingdoms kept incredible records and in their records they, they give um, some information on the origin of where some of these kingdoms come from. So if we look at uh, the Mayans, the Greeks, the Egyptians, the Assyrians, whatever kind of kingdom you want to look at, they all have a similar story and that story goes a little bit like this. The gods from heaven came down and established the first kingdoms. And with it, they brought knowledge and wisdom, crafts of music and warfare, medicine, architecture, all kinds of little goodies. But with it, they also brought destruction, wars, and enslaved men. All right, before we move any further, we need to address this theory. We need to get it clear in our mind's eye. It's going to be one of three things. Either it's true, and these gods really did come down from the heavens and set up these kingdoms or the people came up with this as a myth in order to understand something they didn't possibly understand or three somebody was deceiving somebody in order to keep them ignorant so before we go any further this is where I'm going to sign off we're gonna look in the next video at the importance of the second theory and how it plays such an important part in the King of Kings that is we must understand how people viewed royalty, the royal families, and the first king before we move on to all these other kings that we all know about. Thank you.